thank you, Rob, and um, uh, pleasure also for all the logistical work um, and for Masca for inviting me. Um, so, yeah, as you said, I'm going to talk about agency uh, in ecology as a sort of part of the humanities and ecology as a, a part of the natural sciences, especially biology. And um, yeah, so this question of agency right, is usually defined as the capacity for something to act with a goal. Right, so there, there's some intent, or that uh, a living thing, or perhaps non-living things, are able to act with some kind of goal or some kind of intended consequence. Right, it's a very general, um, very general meaning, um, and you know this can have lots of different forms and sometimes quite elaborate. Elaborate forms, which is why I start with um, the, one of the South African dung beetles. I don't know if people know these things, <laughs> know these animals, but they got some attention because they they roll dung shit into a ball, and you know they collect, and then they need to get away as fast as possible so they don't get eaten or stepped on um, from the animals that the ship is doing, and then they roll it always in a straight line. And they couldn't figure out how this was because it didn't matter if there was no sun or the stars were obscured, they could always do it in a straight line. It always went completely straight. Um, and after lots of very funny experiments involving putting them in mazes and spinning them around and putting hats on their heads, they found out that they actually see the Milky Way. So the, the bands of light that you can sometimes see at night if you're somewhat very dark. You know, see this band of light, but they can see it all the time. And so that's how they're always able to go in a straight line. They see the arms of the galaxy. So this is one, uh, one form of this. So, okay. The problem with talking about ecology, of course, is there's this humanities form of it. Whereas when you say ecology in critical theory or philosophy, um, it often means how is uh, climate change or how is ecology presented or talked about right, within the humanities. And so you have quite extreme versions of this. Uh, Amphil Ghosh's book, which people might know um, from 2015, basically says that the humanities doesn't, can't really wrap its head around climate change or around nature because it's too external and it's too alien to the forms of art and the forms of cultural production that the humanities have engaged in since it was created. So Gosh basically says, literature hasn't really dealt with climate change, literature hasn't really dealt with ecology. Um, and then Mark Gould's book, which is from last year, I believe, he, the whole book is 150 page uh, him of saying that's wrong, <laughs> basically saying, saying Gosh is wrong, and that the problem with Gosh's book is that he's, he's only looking at proper literature, right? So the literary novel, whereas Gould says there's lots of literature, there's lots of cultural productions about climate change, but they're in sci-fi and, you know, fantasy and in things that uh, many people in the humanities wouldn't consider art or wouldn't consider worthy of analysis. So already, just on a very shallow level, there's this disagreement about what does it mean for the humanities to talk about ecology. And so where agency comes in is a lot of the issues have to do with, you know, um, the fact that human, the humanities and the humanism behind the humanities uh, rested largely upon a kind of autonomy of human beings, right? The fact that human beings have agency and that they're rational or they're intelligent beings separate from nature in some way, right? That, and of course, this is a very Western, um, uh, very enlightenment concept, right? That that's what separates humans um, 
from the natural world, and that when the humanities were created, it was sort of a doubling down of this, right? The fact that as the sciences sort of threatened the humanities more and more, there was a sense to say, no, look, the humanities talk about humans as special, ethical, moral, cultural beings, right? So again, we have to sort of redraw the line again. And so Deepesh Chakrabarti, in this quite, uh, it's an essay that's uh, quoted from and talked about quite a lot, which then he's now turned into a book, I think it's a few years old now. Um, he basically says the social sciences and humanities can't deal with climate change effectively because it means talking about the human as an animal, right? the human as a species, not the human as a separate cultural producing special case. Right? Um, and a lot of people have engaged with this critically and, and they're not also in agreement, right? So this kind of question of, um, you know, how are humans different? Is the insistence that humans are different the problem, or do we need to insist that the difference that humans have is how we can actually address ecology and climate change? What, where to put the difference or not difference of human beings? And so, um, obviously, not all the humanities agree on how this is done or what, or what saying a human or saying climate change means. So what you can call critical humanism, which would be Marxism and psychoanalysis and certain forms of structuralism, right, will say that, yes, humans are different, but um, the things that lead to climate change are about, it's directing human agency in not so good ways, right? So like capitalism or the fact that we, humans haven't really dealt with our own narcissism fundamentally or that we need to understand, you know, that human agency is really only ever a collective thing. And so we have sort of bad forms of collective agency, like capital, like ideology, right? Um, obviously, beyond this, there's no agreement about what the human subject is. I'm not saying psychoanalysis and Marxism have been wrong perfectly or, or a kind of genealogical approach um, agrees. But and this is three examples of approaches where there's a sense that humans are different, humans are responsible, but some humans are more responsible than others. And some stories about humanity are more damaging than others, right? So there's some sense that, you know, humanism can be reworked in some way. And then you have what's sometimes called counter-humanism, generally, which would be approaches to humanism saying, yes, humans are different, are separate from the natural world in some way, but we've never really seen what that means. Right? There's only there's been lots of versions of this, but there's never been a real universal um, identification of human capacity. So this is a lot of approaches from post and decolonial studies. Um, so Sophie Winter's work, which I'll talk about um, in the second half, um, you know critiquing this idea of the human when it's, or, or it's only ever been in certain Western forms of what human means, it's never really been a global human of humanism. Or you have approaches like Marisol de la Gadena, uh, or people like Vasta Castro, who would say we just need to radically pluralize the idea of the human and the animal together. Um, or approaches like Max um, Lebron, who basically say colonialism and climate change cannot be separated. They're fundamentally integrated because it all begins with the use of land, the dispossession of certain peoples, and the use of that land. And so there can be no separation. And so again, humans and humanities are worth separating in some sense, but only with this emphasis on the relation between different human groups and human histories, right? With a sort of an eye towards colonialism in particular. And then um, a form of humanism or a discourse that more people know and that you talk about, gets talked about more with ecology, of course, is post humanism, which is a huge you know, umbrella term, um, but often includes animal studies, science and technology studies, especially the feminist articulations of it, you know, feminist philosophy, um, and often has to do with questions of embodiment and questions of agency as a material issue. And material can mean, you know, 
actual like bodies and like the capacities of, of flesh and the capacities of matter and physical instantiations of it. Or it can also mean who gets to count as an agent, like who is written in such a way to have agents. And obviously this has a long history with um, the different articulations of, of who counts as a subject, right? And the subject always being coded as male or coded as, you know, Western in a certain sense. Um, so, but again, the agency is seen as something that doesn't necessarily belong specifically to humans, but can also be animals can have agency um, and discourses can have agency in some regard. And so the last sort of most extreme form, you could say, is various non-human approaches to ecology and humanities. And so, I mean, I imagine some of you are probably familiar with the first two texts, but right? the notion is to say that agency is sort of part of the world or that it's a kind of bottom-up approach, right? The fact that the capacity for action is shared by potentially everything. And so not only non-human animals, but maybe even non-living like entities. Um, you know, Karen Barad is sort of doing this through her reading of quantum quantum physics, that you know, relations produce things. My relations are kind of productive um, all the way down. Things are secondary. Uh, or Jane Bennett, you know, talking about how about things like pollution or a power system or the fats in our bodies can be seen to have agency, right, in some way. There's there's very much a question of emergence. Like that the capacity to act emerges from sort of levels or, uh, or you know or interconnections of these inorganic non-living things and then one of the more extreme forms of this or consequences of this for humans would be Patricia McCormick's work where she basically says that humans should recognize these non-human agencies and basically step aside and go extinct um, she has an antinatalist view, so she says we should stop reproducing and we should let nature sort of be free from us. So that's another sort of form of the non human or the alien, as she says. Okay, so that's the sort of quick and dirty survey of all these different ways that um, agencies are talked about. And so now, um, I just talk, I will talk uh, briefly about how agency plays out in the biological sciences and how it relates to ecology as a science, right? As an interdisciplinary life science. So this is just a schema I made up um, to, in order to teach uh, humanities students biology and it sort of works most of the time, I think. Um, so I'll just kind of go through it. Um, so this I, I already mentioned with, with the gun beetle. This idea of animal agency, right? So in a lot of contemporary biology and philosophy of biology, there's a sense of that we need to sort of focus on the level of the organism, right? So not have a genetic oriented view, but to say that no organisms react and do things in their environment that is novel and unpredictable. And it means that they have intentions which can't be reduced easily to hardwired instinct or to a genetic program. So this is a really famous case um, of this argument. It's a bird called a blue tit uh, in England, largely. And so for many years, when people got their milk delivered to their door, they learned how to peel off the tin foil, and then they would drink just the fat. So you can see just the good fat on top, and then they were done. And they taught other birds how to do this. So it spread through a sort of cultural inheritance. Other birds learn how to do this. And importantly, um, the two important things is that nothing in their regular bird life uh, would have prepared them to learn this. Like there was no easy thing they just transferred to the milk bottle. Like it wasn't like opening a seed or something. And the second thing is that once people's milk got more homogenized and there was no longer the fat on top, they stopped doing it. So it was no longer worth it for them. So people use this as an example of saying there's some, either there's some kind of process or there's something, right? They have an intention, they have a goal, 
and it's something novel and unexpected that happens. So that's sort of part of the claim. Um, okay, and then you can have a more sort of extended form of this agency in terms of how animals deal with environmental forces in various ways. So one of the most uh, common examples of this is, I realize this is a very North American example, um, but um, beavers, uh, right? If, you know, they construct dams, right? They block a river, the river produces a sort of shallow lake, lots of species move in and benefit, the beavers also benefit because they're faster underwater than on land. They build their little houses on top, which they can enter from the water, so they're protected. Um, but of course, rather than sort of fitting their environment, right, the, the notion is they have a form of agency which adapts the environment, right, it reshapes it. So the dam doesn't just benefit them in various ways, but it benefits many other animals. The <laughs> dam serves as a land bridge for like moose and deer, large animals can walk across it. Uh, it protects the forest from fires. It's, it functions as a fire break, right? Because the, the trees are more evenly watered, so it stops drying brush from forming. And also, um, when the beavers die, their houses get inherited by the next generation. So when a teenage beaver has to leave the home, they, they go off and they find an old house and fix it up. Right, so there's also this cultural inheritance, um, cultural inheritance, right, um, generation to generation. So it's a quite complex uh, thing. Okay, and then in terms of function, function, we're talking about living things in terms of functions, is often seen as sort of falling short of agency. Right, so function can be anything from how your body regulates heat. Right, or your respiratory system, circulatory system, right? all these things that happen without you having to tell them to happen. I got um, automatic. Um, and then, of course, the, the blurry boundary between this and agency is something, you know, an example is like chameleon uh, camouflage, because actually, when they change colors, the camouflage thing is actually secondary or tertiary. The, the main function of their color change is to tell other chameleons how they're feeling, actually, supposedly, um, and it also regulates their heat. So, right, because if you're, so being green in a green forest makes sense because you're cooler, it also camouflages you. Um, but of course, if you get pissed off, they'll turn like red and, and orange and stuff, and so it tells other chameleons, you know, and sometimes scares off other animals. So, the point is, right, this is a sort of it seems like an automatic function that collects their skin, and these crystals realign, and these chemicals move around, and that's how they change color. It's really complicated, actually. Um, but there's a question of, you know, is this really agency, or is it just automatic, right? So this is how the sort of function discourse is. And then, lastly, is organisms thought about in terms of form. This is probably the most uh, straightforward notion, right? It's about your morphology, right? How many limbs do you have? Do you have water? What's the structure of, of the animal? Right. And, and what are the mechanics of how you move and these kinds of things? Okay. So then, um, between each of these things, there's sort of relations you can talk about. Right? So this is in blue, right? Kind of self organization, development. Adaptation and variation. Right, so, this is you can kind of see these as the concepts which kind of bridge these bigger um, clusters. Right? And, you know, two of these are pretty Darwinian, uh, right? The notion of adaptation, right? I, I assume people have a sense of this, right? But that animals adapt to their environments to varying degrees. Right? Um, this is, uh, yeah, they're captioned in German. Um, but this is stickleback fish, they have, so they have spines on the back. Um, and they're very famous, they're studied really intensely because they adapt very wildly based on their environment. So you can plop one and three, you can take two that are the same and put them in three different ponds and they will vary hugely in terms of their color, in terms of how they behave. They're very, they have high phenotypic plasticity. 
is the biology phrase for it. And there's very, very, you know, they can adapt quite wild. And then self organization, right? Um, so, this is how the agency of individual animal right as collective can produce unexpected, almost environmental effects. Right, so um, this is called a murmuration, which is, you know, we have of starlings, and every once in a while the starlings form a cloud that looks like, like one giant bird. It's a rare thing that happens, but this is what happens. Right, and so just the effect of the birds like, maximizing their distance to each other, and wanting to see another bird but not being completely in the way, right, and then form these complex moving clouds, which I think, you know, Maybe you've seen. Um, and so there's a sense that when agency is multiplied and built up, you get these novel, kind of unpredictable effects. And then um, de development, right? The sense of how um, organisms, um, during the development, the development isn't strictly pre programmed, right? That some organisms even are able to alter their own development as they age. So this is an axolotl. Um, I don't know if people know these. They, they become very popular as pets. There's lots of uh, um, um, that's, oh, I'm breaking on the word. That's right. Um, there's lots of videos of these online. They became very popular um, uh, with teenagers or something. Um, but anyways, they can they can adapt their own development. They can be they can stay babies for a long time, or they become adults very quickly, and they can change this. Um, and it's partially about the environment, but there also seems to be some interior mechanism that they're able to do this. They're also highly regenerative. They grow wings back very quickly. And yeah, again, they're highly studied because they have all these interesting capacities. They're from a Mexico City region originally. There's actually more of them in labs now than in the wild. Okay, and then variation is again more straightforward, right? The fact that you can have many, many forms of one species and the variation doesn't necessarily affect the function, right? The flowers may have slightly different coloration further away, much more, again, looking at agency as something that kind of from the bottom up, right? Humans are just one example of it. Okay, so again, that's sort of that sort of follows. Um, this is the same information just presented in a in, um, sort of more practical sense in terms of the relationship between humanities and ecology. So again, I'm just sort of repeating myself a bit. You know, critical humanism is looking at genealogy and what forms with which humans are doing what, right, is going to be more interested in conservation or on the other extreme, something like geoengineering, right? So. You can think humans have a special role to play, but you might think it's a highly technological one, or you might think it's a radically, you know, retreat one, <laughs> like degrowth or conservation or something, you know, but in either sense, you think humans have an extra responsibility. And so again, human agency is sort of has a managerial kind of role. And then with counterhumanism, right, there's more emphasis on sustainability, indigenous practices, right? Um, Again, sort of looking towards colonialism is in bed with climate change and capital um, encroachment. And then again, post-humanism and this material agency right, is, is generally more open to talking about agency as an organismal thing, right? something that applies to living things in different ways. And then lastly, non-humanism, right, which emphasizes this bottom-up emergent way of talking is going to be generally looking at sciences beyond the, the life sciences. Um, so looking at non-Darwinian biology, but also looking at emergence of physics or you know, seeing agency is a much more general thing. Okay, so hopefully you can see that there's um, you know the question of what agency is very quickly becomes a political question, right? Because the whole sense of who is doing what, how are they doing it, should we let animals 
alone because they have the agency to be in a way, you know, like there's a whole question of like what's what's the level of engagement, what's you know, who is doing uh, what degree of climate change, how much of it is, you know, should humans just go extinct? Um, you know, like what's the sort of like who stuck the knife and then what do you do? Like who where does responsibility lie? Is responsibility the same thing as agency? Right? I mean, I hope you know, there's a sense there, right, that it becomes very quickly a, it's a political issue. Um, and then, so for this, this sort of second comment, I think that, um, the sort of second half, um, or sort of what I want to argue and talk about, is specifically Sylvia Winter's work. Um, because I think she responds to all of these problems and sees all these different claims about agency in a really important way, in a way that's um, um, it tries to sort of cut across this problem of the humanities and the sciences being divided, and this problem of of you know, you know shifting the focus away from agency to the focus on what's the human actually. So I don't know if people are familiar with her work. I don't know if people know Sylvia Winter's stuff. Um, she's she's a, a Jamaican-born, um, I should say, the Honorable. She's been knighted, I should say that. Um, so she's an Honorable Sylvia Winter. Um, so she's a Jamaican-born poet, playwright, novelist, critical theorist, philosopher. And she's been writing since the 1960s. So she's in her 90s. Um, but in the last few years, the last decade, especially her work has been getting a lot of attention because of more focus on um, decolonial practices, right, and, and taking a hard look at the academy and what the humanities especially see as their responsibility relative to the history of colonialism. And so because of that, her work has come back up to light and she was writing stuff about this 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, attacking the humanities for being too self-involved and too defensive about the sciences. So it's something particularly interesting about her work is she's very open to the sciences. Like she's, she's very interested in neurology and neuroscience and biology, and she really takes it seriously. Um, and at the same time, she's writing from the perspective of, of black studies. Right? She's trying to do humanities and to see the relationship of the humanities and the sciences from a position of, of you know, somebody who knows the you know, Caribbean realm of thought. Right? So she's trying to sort of um, cut across all these divisions in the humanities from a very different position than the one that's usually privileged. And so in her work, she kind of addresses all these different forms of the humanities that I started with. Right? And she kind of takes something from them and then she critiques them at the same time. So, in terms of critical humanism, she you know trained as a or she studied and, and was worked a long time in Marxism and political economy. But she thought that Marxism, in general, didn't really understand uh, the difference between colonialism and capitalism. Right? She sort of thought that there was an equation there that was too easy, and that the sort of genealogical approaches about the subjectivity and about power and domination were still too Eurocentric, right? So she believes a lot in Marxist critique and in Foucault's genealogies, right? Looking at you know, how the subject of a certain discipline is made. But she says, but you need to do that on a really global scale. You have to do that actually in a global way, not just in this French way, or not just in this limited sense. Um, and then, um, she's very critical, and I think this made her very unpopular in the 90s, especially. She was very critical of how the humanities hid behind a certain view of aesthetics. And this goes back to what I said at the beginning with the critique of Anton Gosch, right? The sense that he's saying there's no climate change, there's no ecology in proper works of literature, right? And um, so Winter kind of says, this, there's this aesthetic decision about what counts as proper material, and this way the humanities defends itself, right? So this is how it's kind of auto created it, it writes its own boundaries and decides what it can exclude, and it does this by using aesthetics, 
Right? So high art and low art, for instance, allow you to draw political boundaries without the same you're doing that. So for Winter, you know, she sees this as a problem in the post-humanities because people in the post-humanities will say, let's stop talking about human agency, let's talk about animal agency. And Winter will say, you know, would respond with, well, we've never seen human agency yet. We've only seen like a certain European flavor of it. We've never actually seen human agency in a global, properly historical way. It's never been seen. No one's ever actually pointed to it. So if you want to go beyond something, it's really want to go beyond a certain discourse without changing the fact that you want to be safe within a certain aesthetic shield. Right? And in a similar way, sort of this response to talking about the non-human, she would you know, I think she would see and has talked about as being still too bound up with very Christian, very old school ideas about cosmology and theology, right? So what counts as the radically different, what counts as the radically non-human is still, you know, it's still coming from a very limited place. And so the idea of an absolute other, what the idea is the complete cosmologically bizarre, whatever, is still very much limited. And she says, again, until you understand what mythology is in a global sense, you're not really going to understand the non-human, right? She, her, her, a comment that she often makes is she'll say the category of the human is an occupied territory, right? So the human has never been an open space. It's always been filled with a particular content. So this is why people will say the human or human rights or human whatever, and really what they mean is, you know, enlightened man or economic man or some other form of this. Okay, so this is as crazy as the diagram will get. This is, it won't add anymore. Um, but hopefully that's legible. Uh, so what I think, um, I mean, what I find interesting about Winter's, Winter's work, I mean, besides her engagement with, you know, from this position of black studies, from, um, being critical of the humanities in general and being open to the biological sciences uh, and not wanting to guard the humanities from what they might claim is that she sort of wants to move this question of the counter-human and put it inside of biology. But instead of saying human agency is here, she's like, well, how using biology and the history of what we know about human civilization, how would you actually construct human agency, what would that actually look like if it was global and properly genealogical and properly Marxist? Then what would the, what would the phrase human agency actually look like? And so she tries to construct that, and she kind of puts forward what she thinks it is. And so these three ideas, which I'll go through, um, but it's just, in case you can't, it's genres of the human, it's the sociogenic principle, and she talks about in terms of punishment and reward, and I'll say what that means. And then homo narrowness, like the idea of humans as being storytelling animals. And so this first comes from this notion of genres of the human. Um, she takes largely from Anissa Sale, you know, who is part of this Martinique um, tradition, uh, which also inspired Fanon, Franz Fanon. And you know, what she says there is that if you actually did genealogy in this global way, you would actually see how so many discourses about history, about what counted as the human, um, were, were just versions of it, right? It wasn't actually ever the human, it was always just various attempts by certain people to construct one. And she, she's inspired in part by Césaire here because he essentially argued, um, you know, writing around the turn, uh, around the mid-century, in this book, right, he, he sort of writes, um, how surprised he was by how surprised Europeans were by what happened in the Holocaust and what happened in Europe. He said, you would only be surprised if you didn't know what colonialism was. And he makes the argument saying it's colonialism turned inward. Right? So he says, if you understand that, then you understand we have a very different idea of what the human was. And, you know, 
the one kind of glare, you know glaring example of this is you know one of the first trials for the Nazi concentration camps was in um, was on what was called Shark Island, right in South um, in South Africa, right where they tested out a lot of the things that they would then the same guys that would take to Germany a few years later, right? So very much in line with Cesare's claim that it's literally transient weather. Then from Fanon, what Winter talks about is this sociogenic principle and this notion of punishment and reward. So this is where the biology starts to come in more explicitly. If she says, look, we are biological beings and the forms of social life, right, the sociogeny, which Fanon says, you know, social life reproduces biological feelings and biological responses. So, you know, there's physiological loops of like reward and punishment when we feel a certain way, when we're inscribed in a certain social situation. Right? This, of course, must inform how social structures were generated. Right? So being identified as, you know, being identified by the color of your skin or identified by your gender or whatever, right? This is, right, this has a physiological effect on how you perceive yourself as well, right? Which is part of Shannon's work. So she says you have to understand that the stories that have been written weren't just written as stories, but they were bound up with, you know, people wrote stories that made them feel good, right? And it produced identities which protected them from others. Um, one of the most extreme examples of this is um, if you look at uh, medieval art around the Crusades, um, white people were pink. Like in stained glass, like their skin was pink. And then sometime around the crusade, it becomes white. You know, why did that happen? Right? And the argument is that, you know, there's obviously an intentional thing to say, well, right, we are holy and some people aren't holy. Right? The fact that people, the clergy had to come up with a way that you could kill other humans and not have it not be murdered. Right? So Killing someone who was black skinned wasn't homicide, it was malicide. It was the destruction of evil. Right? So then you have a very clear, like, redefinition and rewriting of your literal supposed appearance, right? So this is one sort of extreme notion of this. And then the sort of last big term that she introduces is like this notion of, of homo narrans, right? So that if there's something fundamentally universally human, she thinks it is this capacity of writing narratives. And so she thinks all humans narrativize fundamentally, and we have to understand um, how any understanding of our biology is going to have to deal with this fact. Right? The fact that, you know, as long as humans have been able to be called humans, she thinks there have been productions of what it means to be human. Right, so that what it means to be human is the story of saying what does it mean to be human, right? And so to actually see a genealogy of this would actually get us towards seeing what human agency, you know, might be. And again, she thinks certain stories have dominated that more than others. Now, um, so again, why I think this is. I mean, why I really like her work. Why I think her work is important, and you know, she doesn't need me to think it's important. Obviously, like the huge amount of um, work being done and publishing her stuff now, and tons and tons of students um, and professors are talking about her work. Um, but there's still a lot of resistance to her work, especially for people in post humanities. Um, um, but um, several reasons why I think her work is important in outside of academia, for instance, would be that she presents a kind of anti-deep history. So now, if people know the term deep history, they're sometimes, sometimes called big histories, like Harari's book is one of the most famous ones at the moment, right? Like the history of man, right? <laughs> human civilization or whatever. Um, and it's essentially like not that conceptually different from stuff that was being said 300 years ago. And so part of what Winter is saying is like, you know, look, you're telling the same story again. You just 
adding statistics and like you know other discourses, but the fundamental story hasn't changed because it's still rooted in something else other than fact finding, right? Or Steven Pinker, um, which really this book put me to such a rage. It was like a punishment. Um, you know, which is I mean, is defending reason, right? Let's defend rationality. Let's all be good scientists, and then he decides who counts as a scientist, and it's like the philosophers he likes, basically. Um, or this book by Joseph Heinrich, right, where it's, as you can see, right, um, how the West is so great, um, and, you know, but, you know, I don't know if you can read it, so weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, and the, the book, does not mention the word colonialism, which I'm not really sure how you say industrialization and wealth happened in the West without that word, but it's really strange to read. Right, so again, I think Winter is like the anti-form of this. She's like, she likes this idea of deep history, of big histories, but she's like, but you actually have to do it for real, right? You actually have to mean it. You can't just say, Yes, great history. Let's start with Descartes. She's like, no. Right? You actually have to say, no, where do you start? Like, even that's a hard question. Right? Like, you can't just fall back on the same stock plots right, again and again. Um, and then the other reason why I think her work is important, and this is really about her engagement with genetics and this biocultural, right, the intermeshing of the biological and cultural, is that she's also served as a very good critical eye to this kind of work. Um, this is just a textbook. But now people know behavioral genetics as a field. It's getting a lot of attention, um, especially in the last 20 years, I want to say. Um, but right, it's people who try to draw a somewhat direct line from genetics to behavior. Right? In the sense, like, there's a gene for I mean, there's been lots of study, even in the 90s, right, people love saying there was one gene for something, which there's never been one gene for anything, by the way, that's never happened. You can kind of say that with really nasty inherited diseases, um, but it's, you cannot say that with behaviors or even traits. Like, you need like 15 genes for your eye color, so it's, it's nonsense. Um, but there's a, a big push now, people doing these more complex studies saying, oh, we found the gene for homelessness, which is what the book in the middle claims, for instance, and she got a wonderful, glowing review in the New York Times, like just the most lavishly praising, like, oh, she's trying to convince these stupid humanity scholars who are anti-science that genetics matters, and that she's really struggling against them, and it's really hard. And you know she she doesn't understand what her is. Like she, she just picks she nitpicks she picks the studies of genetics that basically say some people are naturally skilled and some people aren't, and therefore we should remake society in that way. And she can claim to be leftist, it's hard, and can claim to be leftist because she says, well, yes, the people with bad genes need help, and the people with good genes should be allowed to excel, which is her next book, which I shudder to think. What that would be. Um, the sin, it's like a sin of the pr of privilege or something. That's not what that was. Um, it's probably worse than that. Um, and then Sapolsky, who is a much more sympathetic to, he's very, very, this book is super famous. He teaches at Stanford. His courses are online. He's a very good teacher. And he also makes, he's also a behavioral geneticist, but he, he, geneticist, but he has a much more complex um, picture and he's left, <laughs> left center. But he still falls back into some too easy um, ideas. So again, you know, I think Winter is really trying to say, why, why are you just trying to prove the stories that already exist? You know, how do you actually look at the, the biology without doing this? And then this is, I mean, so I'll end with the next, next slide and then I'll, I'll stop talking if I haven't. Okay. Um, so now on the positive side, where there's more productive engagements um, with her work is 
there's more and more biology and philosophy of biology that's looking at non-gene-centric approaches to the organism. I don't know if people know Peter Godfrey Smith, he wrote this book about this octopus intelligence that was quite called Other Minds, which was got a lot of attention. Um, this is his second book. Or his first book after that book. Um, so basically saying, you know, looking at how intelligence evolved in other species starts to tell us something about you know, how agency might actually be seen you know, across all organisms. Or um, LeBlanca and Ginsburg, um, Eva LeBlanca is quite famous. She's one of the most famous people who writes about epigenetics. And so how your environment uh, affects which genes you transcribe and which ones don't. Right, um, so how trauma and other environmental factors can deactivate genes in a different way. And this is very complicated, I can talk about it if people are interested. Um, but you know, how this plays into consciousness, how um, human consciousness especially evolved. And Terence Deacon, um, who Winter cites a few times explicitly, you know, talking about how we go from physics to biology to eventually something like language, right? So this non-reductive kind of approach um, to sort of show you what, how could you build something like an actual universal human? How could you say the species human and actually have it mean something, you know, that isn't completely um, corrupted by a certain political agenda or, you know, um, certain you know, viewing organism or viewing animals as less than human, right? So it's trying to find this balance. And this is then three works who also engage with Winter's work extensively. Um, and these are all from the Black Studies. Um, and so, for instance, the first book by Malay, um, you know, sort of uses Winter's work and tries to critique the Eurocentrism of something like biopolitics, so critiquing Agamben, for instance, um, for talking about the subject of law and not actual bodies before the law. Or uh, Jackson talks about the human animal divide and how this has to be thought, especially in terms of, of blackness, um, because obviously there's a long history of, you know, um, People of color being seen as the most animal like, even if they were still technically human, right? They were put at the bottom of the ladder. And so when you have animal studies people saying human animals are the same, you know, you have to do that with knowledge of this history, otherwise that's a problem. No, no not, a, not a small problem. Like what does it really mean to say you have to really think about the human um, animal connection with, with this pure colonialism, otherwise you're, you're repeating right, these ridiculous errors, these you know, shallow stories. And then King's work also taking this notion of, of winter and human and, and thinking about it in terms of geography. Right? That you actually have to think about um, the places where the idea of human comes from. It's going to be different obviously based on the histories of the place, but that some kind of universality is still possible. It can still be constructed. Um, and so it's not a deflationist kind of project. It's, and it's not, it's, not, um, it's not against the humanities per se, it's against the form of them that they you know, become you know, calcified by. And of course, you're seeing this happen now with Winter's work and you know, there's other, um, um, you know, a lot of universities are saying, yes, let's decolonialize the curriculum, and they add, like, two people of color to the syllabus. Like, okay, we've done it. Right? And since the 90s, when Sophia Winter was saying, you know, I don't want an African-American studies department. I want the literature departments to teach, to teach this stuff. And this is why she was very, uh, I think people were not happy, because she was constantly pointing to the humanities kind of saying, and saying, okay, sure, you know, we'll listen to you, so here you go. She's like, no, I want the thing to be written. I don't want an extra piece, you know, I want something structural has to change. Um, and so, and this is why I think 
there's something very important and, and the, the word is and how it goes back to ecology and she mentions ecology explicitly is that um, you know she puts these terms sort of in relationship to you know function and form and force but she never claims to know what agency is like that's the term she actually suspends she says we haven't seen it we don't really know um, we don't really know what it is and so this is the last slide and this is a quote from Winter which I'll read um, you'll also get a sense that she's um, tough. She's very, uh, very inventive um, as a writer. So this is a conclusion of one of her three most known essays. And so, yeah. So that the highly human scientific, how natural scientific recognition of our own agency, that's already a lot, as one that makes possible the extraterritoriality of our self-cognition, we will now find that we humans no longer need the illusions of our hitherto storytelling, extra-human projection of that agency. That therefore we no longer need illusions, such as those which now inter alia threaten the livability of our species, planetary habit, in order to now remain consciously and collectively the new society in which our now existential referent we, in the horizon of humanity, will all now live. That's a lot. Um, but hopefully, hopefully from everything I've said, that makes sense. Um, but, but the sense that, you know, we're in this, the humanities is in this game of projecting agency onto other things. And, you know, we've never seen human agency. We've never seen collectively what humanity can do. It's never been seen. And you all can understand that if you see, you know, understand, you know, the history of colonialism and the history of, you know, these various attempts of constantly trying to retell the same story of man or the human and just committing the same sort of, um, you know, erasures of the past um, and, yeah, instead constantly thinking, we know what agency is, let's give it to animals or let's see what non-living agency is. And her point is like, yeah, we've never seen it actually. And that is just as important um, for ecology and for how we understand who suffers and who suffers less in environmental catastrophe than understanding um, what to do with the animals. So that's the end. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a field that's gotten a lot bigger and there's a lot of excitement about it in the last, I mean, last decade especially, but before that too. Um, and yeah, it's this notion that, right, the recognition that um, certain things can, I mean, sometimes people collapse environment and epi environmental effects and epigenetic effects and they're not quite the same, right? Um, because, um, like, one of the most popular studies is this one that's about rat moms. <laughs> so it's about, it's about lick, rat licking. So there was a study where they realized that um, so let's see, rats who were licked a lot by their moms, you know, just like grooming, you know, um, licked their kids more. And so, it seems strange. 
So when they did all these controls, we thought, okay, was it because like are they copying their mothers and they separate them and they you know, did this very, very interesting experiment? And they're like, no, something was happening at the genetic level. Right? So what happens is there's different forms of epigenetical mechanisms. One is called methylation, right? So certain chemical compounds attach to certain parts of the DNA and say, you know, transcribe for this or don't transcribe for that, which means make protein, make this protein and don't make that one. Um, or um, the more extreme version is there's these things called histones, right, which are like kind of like blobs of protein that the DNA is wrapped around. And some things can happen in an organism's life where the histone will actually engulf the strand of DNA and kind of like eat it. And so it can, which means it will never be turned on. So there's lots of levels. So that so what they realize is that lots of licking, lots of mom licking in the rats activated, right, was causing certain strands to be methylized, right, to be chemically bound, and that not only that, but that they could be passed on to the offspring. And so that was this one of the, one of the first big studies saying, whoa, this is something that's happening here. And of course, more and more studies that they've done, they realized, um, oh yeah, it's, it's happening in all kinds of species, um, and there's a quite, there's a huge study in New Zealand Enough people know this. I don't know how popular this was, but they they studied thousands and thousands of kids from birth until they're like until the thirties, forties, and they realized similar things were happening in humans with depression, for instance, right? And so, the, so like, which doesn't mean right? It doesn't mean there's a depression in you. It means if you have this gene and you get through the age of ten, no one is okay. You're fine. If, <laughs> so you can have the gene and nothing happens. But if you have this gene and then something really messed up happens to you between the ages of eight and ten, this thing is coded for, and then you're really, really likely to get depression. Right? So again, it's not like a causal thing, it's that certain paths get pushed, right? Certain things will be transcribed, and certain things become much more likely if something environmental happens. Right? So so yeah, I mean, it's, um, of course, there's also the ethical thing, which like, you can't really do, you can't really ethically do an epigenetic study on humans for like trauma, for instance, right? Because you have to traumatize a bunch of people uh, intentionally, so that doesn't really work. Um, you know, there's been, you know, some claims that it's happened in the past, uh, with like, um, conditions being passed on and people who were in starvation situations like this, but some people argue it's not the same. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, it really pushes back against a lot of the behavioral geneticists who just say, oh, there's a gene for this behavior. It's like, there's no gene for behavior. There's genes that make certain conditions more likely. But, it's still, but those, these things can also be undone. And so things that get transcribed for it doesn't mean it's passed on, it doesn't mean it isn't then chemical change again, right? So there, there is no like easy causal line. So yeah, it sort of complicates this whole notion of, of agency. Yeah, so there's, you could say there's a sort of chemical agency which pushes human agency more or less likely in one direction, but not definitively like that. Which which the crazy one of us crazy? All of it. But is it based on winter's terms or did you have to look at that for our cell phone? No, the one the ones in the middle are for terms, the ones inside are for terms. So okay. Homo Nerons, Jack Rise with the human associogenic punishment okay. reward systems, those are her terms. So the base for agency was more function is yours? Yeah, that's just mine. Uh, how did you define it for can you make Different one of those, what would the defining base for you? For those four? Yeah, this yeah. would just, yeah, because I was, I was teaching history of biology to, um, yeah, the math right. students, and there was just so many terms and there were so many names, and it just became kind of massive. And so it was basically just 
three years of me being like, what's one schema that can cluster everything? You know, and this is I did this like as a teaching trick, and I refined it and the words changed a bit over time, but I think it mostly works. I think. I mean, I sort of ran through 200 years of biology and said, okay, does it sort of hold up more or less? You know, thinking I'm gonna have to get rid of it, but I think it mostly it mostly works because um, you know, I mean, you can also imagine how like, all the other disciplines. I think mostly because the other disciplines, um, some disciplines of biology, which of course pre-existed biology, right, like medicine, right, like medicine or um, you know, like forms just like morphology and development, which like um, embryology, right, all that stuff is going to be over there, whereas function is going to be, you know, anatomy, physiology, right, these kind of discourses, right, whereas agency is more about the organism, right, the more about like the beginnings of biology, um, right, there's a sort of capacity for action, right, so this is um, connected to ecology a bit, but also connected to um, uh, yeah, the organism is something different, right, from the mongolian world, which, you know, that wasn't really proposed until quite late, which is weird. I think biology became a discipline around 1800, which seems strange. But it was only then around the 1700s, somebody said, maybe living things are different than not, which seems like, you think, like, what? But that's because life wasn't about, you know, life wasn't about what you were made of or what shape you were. Right? It was that you had the capacity to move and react just because you had a spirit, right? Because you had vital, something vital about you. But it was like, you know, it was the medical disciplines, partially, and then also people who studied zoology were like, maybe there's a, maybe there's like organic matter. Like, maybe that's different? I mean, some, you know, right? Like, which of course was a, a heretical thing to say. Because right? what makes life different is soul or right, an animating principle, not anything having to do with stuff. Not with matter, not with, you know. So it was also, you know, trying to sort of see how, yeah, these other disciplines which fed into biology to sort of keep them you know, different but still related. So I mean, that's why I mean, this just a lot of brute force trial and error, basically. <laughs> I, okay, I think these capture most of the stuff in environment. Um, yeah, it could still break. It's definitely possible. Yeah. I've gotten to the 1980s in my history of biology, so it's like, well, that's a great thing. Great Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's um, that's a big part of like Peter Dr. Smith's work. But, um, yeah, because of course you have these long traditions, right, in ethology, right, the study of animal behavior, where, right, there was generally two approaches of like behaviorism, right, where you don't assume anything, you just watch what they can do, right, or cognitivism, right, where you assume something is going on inside their heads and you try to, you know, you try to go to where the animals live and not stick them in the lab, but instead hang out with them. 
kind of figure out like, okay, what are they really capable of? What can they really do? And of course, both are very much to human eyes. And, and there's a lot of, um, I don't know if you know, there's this really nice book called, Are We Smart Enough to Know if Human, sorry, Are We Smart Enough to Know if Animals Are? Um, and he gets this, the, the wall, I think, is his name. Uh, and he kind of shows this history of how, you know, you know, yeah, like how hard it is to get around this human bias. Because, like, for instance, when they, they were testing the intelligence of elephants, and so they, they put it this classic test, right? If you put something outside their cage, of course, their cage goes off when it's bad. And you put something outside their cage and you give them a stick. And you say, because, right, the classic test is with monkeys, because the monkey will take the stick and find your under the bars. And the elephants didn't do that. And so a bunch of you know, behaviors were like, oh, well, elephants are dumb. Okay. Now, if you're an elephant, no. you don't like grabbing sticks as tools because then you can't smell it. If your trunk is, yeah, trunk's not an arm. So they fail, right? <laughs> That's the first failure. And then it's like, you know, um, you know so it's like this whole point is like you have to actually see, right, the animal in terms of what its capacities are and its interests. Like, okay, put something above the elephant and give it a box. And then we'll kick the box. You know, uh -huh. And then stand on the box and then go, <laughs> right? But they don't want to hold the stick because then they can't smell, right? So it's like, so there's that level. And then, you know, I mean, Godfrey Smith goes even further and this book ended up kind of a genre. And because he basically says, I think what you just said in the sense of, he describes, um, I think the metaphors from Wittgenstein, but he says like maybe animal, maybe consciousness for every different species is like a walled garden. He says we just won't ever see, we won't ever really see what's inside. Right? We'll never be able to do that. So yeah, the question becomes if you have not the behaviors view, but the cognitive view, if you think yes, all animals have something going on, something like agency they have, and even more than that, we want to say they have inner experience. Then, yeah, what can you do besides protect them from exploitation by humans? But right? you can just say, therefore, they count as persons, right, in this legal sense, right, which has also been applied to ecological systems, but you know, right, like even rivers, some rivers, right, or, or environments can be counted as legal persons. Is that enough? Right, I mean, it just, it's sort of like a shield saying, you know, you don't mess with them, um, but you still get very stupid articles by people who are like, can X feel pain? Like, can snails feel pain? Do fish feel pain? And of course, all of this question is, well, we're going to find out. And yeah, there's torture in living things. You know, so if it stops that, it seems good. But then the question is, is this the legal form, which of course is very human-centric in a way, is that enough to just say, they're human enough that you shouldn't hurt them. I don't know. I mean, we're starting to see what the effects of this will be. Um, um, yeah, whether the same no legal persons will be enough. I mean, it would be nice if it was, but I won't be worried. It won't be. And do you like have any thoughts, like, because? It seems like he, I mean, it's like Gary Lederberg, like he's the other, right? Like, I see the other in the last movie. And there, there was this thought that, like, it's connected to, like, skepticism, you know, like, already from a young age, how you receive that, and how, like, you can, and you form that spider for your relation, and as if, like, if we change that already in the young age, that we wouldn't maybe have. Perceive like others in, in like in humans. So like mm. um, the phrase, for example, but I, I think what we're talking about today was maybe that what we actually should be doing is first like um, focus on humans. So like the fact that we already in like the species we have like we should be thinking about the uh, species that we raise that can identify how to be we find like the formants so we need to them from ours. Yeah, I guess the hope is it can be done at the same time, you know, because yeah, you're right, of course, and there's um, there's a lot of people who, like, when Winter talks about Fanon's work, 
right? Because he was also a practicing psychiatrist, of course, so he, he did um, a lot of work on, on the, what is, you know, the internalizing this identity. You know, someone else called you that, right? Am I that name? Right? And so this course, am I that slur, right? Um, and then how that affects people's perceptions. And of course, yeah, we have you know, thousands of years of like, those people are other, those people are other, those people are other. I point, right? Christianity being like a really good example, right? Like how, like, let's make Jesus more white this year. You know, like it seems to happen every year that Jesus becomes like, you know, uh, a spotlight with eyeballs um, at Christmas time. Oh, um, yeah, there's, um, I think, I think, um, where there's interesting crossover, and some people who work in de escalation work also address this. They say that many people have immediate physiological reaction to someone they've been told is other, right? Um, and so the point is, like, how do you, this is like where the physiological feedback and punishment reward stuff comes in. It's like, you know, how do you train people, you know, to not react to something that they haven't pushed into them for, you know, their entire lives. So the question is, yeah, is, does that structure overlap with, with animals? And I think you're right. Um, there's even a funny, there was a funny point made by Stephen Jay Gould, who was a geophonologist, and he made a point saying how if you look at cartoon animals, they become more baby-like. And it's even in some languages, like in German, for instance, anything that, anything that looks cute and has big eyes has a diminutive ending. And other animals don't. So this is like a really weird, like, like, you know, chin, right? Like, you know, I'm saying, I can't do it, right? Like, I'm saying, you know, like, it's just like, cute little, like, you know, the cute version. And so there is this kind of strange training of like, yeah, we'd like, you know, that's why Mickey Mouse's eyes got bigger and bigger every few years. The Google actually makes a chart and you can see, like, how Mickey evolved into a baby. Right? And so there is also this, it's a similar, I think, structural bias that, yeah, we want to perceive, um, but of course, this is also very culturally locked too, in I think ways that we almost forget. Um, and I know this because um, this is a short anecdote. Um, I was at dinner with a, with a bunch of people, and the person next to me, one of my friends, um, who's Australian, and we were just talking about all the things that almost killed us as kids, because we both grew up in the I grew up in the desert, and she grew up in Australia. So like, yeah, there's this spider, yeah, but this spider's even worse. Yeah, but there's a scorpion, like, yeah, but like, did you ever have one of these poisonous snakes? And like, yeah, but you get spiders over your head in Sydney. And like, yeah, but like, and like, everyone else at the table were English, and they were just horrified that this was possible. Like, for them, nature was like a green hell with a sheep on it. You know? Like, that was it. Um, and so then you start to think about it. It's like, yeah, not only like what you grow up with, but then, yeah, but the books you read. You know, say it's cute and not that the bad guys are rats and the good guys are mice. Like, like that's a really good example. Um, yeah, I mean, like how would you how would you undo that? Um, and of course, that's very nicely, you know, um, and it connects with ecology and like a certain sorts of ecological awareness at least, right? In the sense of like, you know, don't you know, don't step on a centipede, you know, because of the centipede, right? Or like, you know. I actually did a talk on how cuteness is an ecological threat, right? That the animals that get funding in zoos, for instance, are the cute ones. Right? Everyone wants to donate money to see the pandas. We, we spend the amount of money we spend on keeping pandas alive, right? Is because they're cute. Whereas, like the salamander, bats, even stuff that's more endangered, you know. Like, yeah. So I, it's. I think this is why this is. It's, and as Winter says, it's an aesthetic form. It's really about being super conscious about your aesthetics. And the yeah, species and the racism, obviously, they're not the same because of the history, not the same. But there's a fundamental aesthetic blockage that, yeah, we teach, that we teach very early. Yeah. And there's no reason to do that. Right? Like, but would it be radically, radically universal cuteness? Kids like all animals. Would that do anything? I don't know. That sounds nice. Maybe it would do something ecologically. But, you know, yeah. This is all against uh, group exploration. 
Well, <laughs> now you put me into a bind because I have friends with a big story. Um, it was actually the same person, yes. It would be on the yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, I think it's a real, it's a ecological problem. It is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Zoos would look great. Yes, I could eat this for people. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's good. I shouldn't say anymore. I'm on the record. I'm going to get a letter. I'm going to get a letter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.